You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is November 26, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, problem-based learning. Our presenter is, yours truly, Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm the director of the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. At any rate, um, today we kind of have an allergy potpourri of different topics. But the first topic that we were assigned to talk about is problem-based learning. Uh, and we're not going to talk about problem-based learning so much as we're going to actually make a case. We're going to develop a problem-based learning case. Have you made a case already? Have you actually done it? So we're, we're going to actually do problem-based learning. <clears throat> and then we'll use the case to uh, do a case. Anyway, so uh, welcome. Um, let's just move ahead. Um, I have no disclosures that are relevant to this discussion. And these are my learning objectives. Now, so I know that Dr. Dowling spent some time talking with, uh, with each of you about problem-based learning. And it's good to learn about it and hear about it. But, th but the reality is, if you want to get to Carnegie Hall, uh, how, do you get, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? That's the old, the old question that I think Roger, Rodney Dangerfield used to, to ask. And of course, you, know, you expect to get the ant directions to go, go to Broadway and turn left and do all of that stuff. But you don't read about it or sit in lectures about how to perform instruments. You have to practice and practice and practice. So doing it is more important than just learning about it. So we're going to actually do it today. I'm not sure that this keyboard is going to respond no matter what I do. Um, it turns out that, well, this is how we learn. How, how do people learn anyway? I mean, I, I remember going to medical school and sitting in lectures and this was me in medical school. I don't think I ever stayed awake for an entire lecture. It, it just never happens. Um, this is uh, Allergy Fellows from several years ago listening very intently to a, a really nice lecture. Um, <laughs> by five minutes, they were kind of nodding a little bit. And by 10 minutes, they're, they're gone. <laughs> and that's pretty typical. The reality is, if you want to, um, if you want to learn, if look at the learning pyramid, the, the least effective way to learn something is to sit in a lecture like I'm giving right now. So I'm, what I'm doing right now is very ineffective. Uh, obviously, you can read about it. Um, you can look at the little video clips of it, which can be a little bit more entertaining and interesting. You can actually see a demonstration of it. Kevin Kennedy came in and demonstrated all the gadgets that he uses to do home assessment. So that's actually a lot more interesting. and. Uh, um, it keeps your attention than just sitting in a lecture. Uh, ultimately, we could have a discussion group like we're going to have in a few minutes, um, or you could just you could practice doing it. You can actually do it. But the most effective way is to teach others about something. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you wanted to learn something, and the best way to learn it is to teach it to somebody else. That's why we have each of you give many of these didactic lectures, because by teaching it to us, you're, you're actually doing the most efficient way of learning it yourself. <clears throat> there are many ways to learn. You can learn by going to books or magazines. But ultimately, if you look at the sheer mass of publications that are coming out, the number of textbooks, the number of articles, and so on, uh, it's so overwhelming. There's no way you can actually get access to all of the knowledge that is available. Um, so it's, it's, it's hopeless. And I strongly discourage everyone from taking the latest journal of allergy and reading each article cover to cover. Do not do that. If you really insist on doing it, I guess I can't stop you. But I, it's not a very effective way to learn stuff. Uh, instead, what you want to do is to have a problem that you want to learn about and then look up articles relevant to that problem. That's the most efficient way, rather than just reading whatever random articles the editor decided to put in the journal that particular month. Of course, if any of them were authored by yours truly, you should probably read those. So the old way of learning was that the teacher would take the knowledge and pour it out into the student who would suck it up like a sponge, right? That's what you're doing, you're sucking it up. But, but really, the better way is for the learner to take this vast lake of experience 
and suck it up into themselves so that they can learn it their own way. Uh, and the facilitator is the straw that helps the knowledge, the experience, the information get it from where it is, the reservoir, up to the learner. So instead of having a teacher that pours knowledge onto the student, we have students help being helped to suck up the information into their own way of looking at it. Okay, I like metaphors. These are, these are all kind of graphic. There's different learning scenarios. Here, this is still a lecture, but it's not going to last much longer. We're going to get into the actual practice. Clinicians, as a medical person, uh, I learn by treating patients. And um, if we wanted to uh, use or a teaching modality to learn how to treat patients, we would create a fictitious patient and have you treat them. Um, and that, that would be the most effective way, and that has turned out to be the most effective way to learn how to, to manage patients. If you were a laboratory person, you would learn by working in a lab, doing the research, the studies. Or you could create a fictitious lab situation. Here's the beaker and the chemicals. What would you mix, and how would you do it, and, and so on. But, but, but really, the scenario needs to be relevant to the kind of learning that is desired. If you're a lawyer, you learn work on legal cases. So you might create a fictitious lawsuit uh, and, and work through that. So when we talk about clinicians, that I think we're all thinking of ourselves as clinicians now in this context, although it certainly could be used in laboratory or legal or other scenarios, um, we need a patient. And the patient needs to be fictitious. Um, in many cases, you see situations where a real patient is brought to the table, and then you work your way through that real patient. But the real patient doesn't necessarily have all of the components or aspects uh, that would be helpful to learn about a specific thing. And as a result, it's, it's actually better to create a fictitious patient that's designed specifically to teach a specific thing. Um, so it reduces the urge to include too much information. If you've got a patient, you want to put all that stuff that's in the medical record into the, into the case, when in fact most of it's irrelevant to what the learning is all about. Um, it can also be designed to teach the learning objectives, which you come up with first, right? When you want to teach something, you won't know what you want to teach with the objectives and then you design the teaching experience to teach those objectives. It's not how we do it, is it? Most of us come up with a set of PowerPoints and then say, well, what objectives do these PowerPoints teach? And then we write the objectives at the end. It's actually backwards. We should have the objectives first. Uh, <clears throat> when I'm designing a, a problem-based learning case, I think it's helpful to choose a fun name, you know, Chester Huff and Puff. <laughs> Doesn't that look like a kid who might you might learn about asthma with, you know, or Isaac B. Itchin, I. B. Itchin, you might have some rash, you know, or William Welts, <laughs> Karen Schatz, Schatz, allergy Schatz, Joe Blow, maybe you learn about spirometry with Joe uh -huh. Blow. Definitely. Okay, come up with fun names like that. It's it's always better that way. <clears throat> You want to adapt the patient to the audience based on the level of knowledge and, and training. And so the learning objectives in the case may need to be modified. More experienced participants can maybe teach the less experienced ones. So if you, uh, if I wanted to teach allergy fellows, I wouldn't start with something that would be appropriate to a first year medical student. That would be a little bit too elementary. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a mixed group of experienced and less experienced people, you can make it sort of in the middle and let the more experienced people help to teach the less experienced people. And then they benefit not only from the experience itself, but from teaching others. And so everybody gets a better learning experience. It's also good to have smaller groups. The ideal size for problem-based learning is maybe 10 people, uh, up to 15 at the most in a small forum like this. But it is possible to teach an entire auditorium full of people. If you, if you get to that point, you may want to take people and have them break into smaller groups and talk among themselves. So it, it can be done in many different ways. So what do you want the person to be able to do? <clears throat> well, uh, people who participate in problem-based learning from a clinician's point of view ought to be able to create a differential diagnosis, perhaps, what, what things might account for the findings that I present. Uh, they should be able to diagnose a patient, maybe to come up with a treatment plan. Uh, if the disease that they have gets worse, how do you manage that? Because some diseases get worse and have flare-ups. You know, if there's laboratory results, how do you interpret those results? 
And uh, also, ultimately, we want you to pass your allergy boards. And ideally, you become really good allergists. That would be the real, the real objective is to make you real good allergists. So these are the learning objectives. These are what we want you to be able to do at the end of the session. And we should probably define them first so that we can design the session to teach the learning objectives. So here's the, uh, here are the steps of problem-based learning, and it's, it's fairly rote. Present the learning objectives. Introduce, the, set the stage of what the case is all about. It's going to be a patient who has some kind of problem that you're going to help them solve. Um, then ask a question. And the first question should be related to the first learning objective. Okay. Then provide some more information or if something happens, the disease flares up, or the patient gets sick, pollen count goes up, whatever. And then you ask another question. And you continue to ask questions, provide more information, something happens, then you ask another question, and you continue that until the patient either is cured or, I guess, dies. You don't have to have that, but it can happen, especially, I guess, in pathology <laughs> cases. <clears throat> uh, learning objectives. Two to four max, OK? If you've ever gone to a lecture where the speaker has 60 slides, and each one is packed full of information, and they say, well, I want to make sure they learn all of this stuff. Well, what are the odds you're going to learn all of that stuff? You're not going to learn it. You can maybe learn two to four major topics. And if you learn those really well, we've had success. Um, so you want to have an example. What should the participant be able to do? So here's, here's some examples. Categorize asthma severity in a 13-year-old. Okay, you would do that by giving information about that 13-year-old, <coughs> showing what ca categories of asthma severity there are, and asking the learner to use those categories on that 13-year-old. Apply it. Okay, to devise a daily treatment plan. We, we're, here we're, we're going to probably we're going to talk about asthma as an example. Now, to manage an exacerbation at home, plan for long-term care. These are all things that physicians ought to be able to do, and Having a problem-based learning case that teaches you how to do those things is, is probably helpful. Remember, one step for learning objective. If you have four learning objectives, which is the max, have four at least four steps. Don't try to do it all in one step. So now it's your turn. And we're going to all work together. Charlie, uh, Car Carmen, um, our two allergy fellows, uh, I'd like you to uh, come up with a case, a pa patient, and here's what you want to do. Choose a condition that you want to teach to develop a case about. This can either be allergic rhinitis, food allergy, or atopic dermatitis. Now, obviously, you could choose any topic you want, but these are suggested topics that you might want to consider because they're fairly amenable to develop being a case using this approach that I'm going to show today. Uh, come up with a patient name, something that's fun and catching and that's actually the most entertaining part of the five minutes, is thinking of patient names. Uh, identify three to four learning objectives, such as make a diagnosis, develop a treatment plan, manage a worsening of whatever the condition is, and then planning for long-term care. Those could actually be your learning objectives, but you want to state them as learning objectives. Um, so what I'd like to do is we're going to take five minutes, and maybe the four of you can, you know, can kind of talk amongst yourselves and come up with that. Uh, I would encourage people online to listen to this conversation and maybe on your own, because I know that you're not together in groups. If you're in groups, um, maybe you can work amongst yourselves in your own little group as well and try to come up with a condition, a name, learning objectives, and uh, it's, it's going to take about five minutes. So take five minutes. Go, go ahead. How about allergic rhinitis? Sure. For the condition. Somebody want to be described and write this down? I can write this down. Okay, go ahead. I'm not very clever, so. <laughs> I'm not very clever. Let's see. It's not a good start. Schnoz. Schnabel. Joe Schnabel. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how to spell? I would spell it. Like, you don't have to use that, but whatever you want. 
<laughs> Jim. I like Jim better. Jim Schnazel. Jim Schnazel. <laughs> Jim Schnazel. <gasps> okay. <laughs> so, three learning objectives. So, how to make the diagnosis. That's good. Learning objective. So, so that would include history and maybe skin test. Or, is this for a group of allergists, like fellows, residents? Who are who's our audience? You know? Well, that's that's a good point. Why do you need to decide what group of learners you're designing this for? So you better make that decision too. Like yeah. residents doing a rotation through sure. okay. So the pertinent history, history. skin test. Yeah, you might have to have them recognize the things that can trigger. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that go on. Right items. History. The history portion. So, so what questions they ask? Triggers. Symptoms. Seasonal or perennial. Um, time frame. Yeah. You might speak a little louder so they can hear what you're saying. Um. So in terms, of, we're thinking of. The pertinent history, so triggers of for his, and then his actual symptoms, and then the time frame when the symptoms occur. Um, r relieving factors or worsening factors, you know, kind of like and then diagnostically do the skin testing, and then based on that you would then develop the treatment plan. Yeah, you have to decide what things you want to test him for and not test him for. I know. And like, you not like test, some, do you do some orders that? I have seen recently where the physician has basically just checked everything on the allergy sheet. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. It depends on whether that's a skill you want the learner to learn. Mm. Well, I guess if, they're, if it's a group of non-allergists, you would assume they would send this child to an allergist to do the specific testing? Maybe one of the learning objectives could be when to send, when to refer. When to refer. What kind of criteria for referral or whatever. <coughs> yeah, so then maybe they wouldn't even do testing. Yeah. <coughs> so they'd recognize it. Maybe they could try a treatment plan and then refer. So when to refer. So. Yeah. So diagnosis, treatment plan, then when to refer. When to refer would be for the management of worsening, maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, Dr. Raji, are you on? Yeah, I am. I'm listening. Oh, she said I'm listening. Hmm. You're listening? Oh, you're very quiet. We can barely hear you. <laughs> can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can chime in, too, if you have any. Okay. Or actually, anybody else on line, if you want to, I'll unmute. As long as you're not making more background noise. Is that enough? Try again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. <laughs> but if you have any thoughts, Dr. Raja, you can chime in also. Yeah, I like the name. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have our objectives, Dr. Portnoy. Okay, so why don't you tell me what condition you're going to teach about? So, allergic rhinitis. Okay. And our patient name is Jim Schnozzle. Jim Schnozzle. Okay, and what are your learning objectives? So, make a diagnosis, so we would, you know, get a pertinent history. Um, so, the first learning objective is to diagnose a pa make a diagnosis in a patient who has allergic rhinitis. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's your next learning objective? Um, so then we would develop the treatment plan. So to develop a treatment symptoms. plan for a patient with allergic rhinitis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the third one would be, you know, teaching the audience when or what to do if the condition is worsening or not improving, and so on that instance and probably say refer to a specialist at that point. So the third objective is to the learner will be able to do what? To learn how to manage a be able to manage a worsening condition or a, a condition that's not improving with rhinitis. Maybe when the pollen count goes up or something. Or to determine when to refer to an allergy specialist. 
then we'll learn how like criteria for the criteria for referral to a allergy specialist. Okay. Does that sound all right, Dr. Raji? Yeah. <laughs> Does that sound okay, Brock? Yep. All right. <laughs> I hear everybody else is unmuted too, so if you want to chime in, speak up. Okay, well, so we've got a case. <clears throat> so now that we've started with the learning objectives, we know what group we're going to teach to. What, what group are we teaching? Who are the learners? Residents. Pediatric or just residents? Pediatric residents. Pediatric residents. Okay. They're past medical school, but they haven't done specialty training, so they're residents, primary care. Okay. Now, now that you've done that, that's the first thing you should do. It's usually the last thing we do, but it really should be the first thing you do. You'll see how it makes it a lot easier to develop the case once you know what you wanted to teach. Uh, now you need to give a history. You need to introduce the patient. This needs to be a very brief introduction to the patient. And when I say very brief, I mean very brief. Be simple and as nonspecific as possible. Remember, this is a generic patient. It's not a specific person. Uh, stimulate the learners to think about the problem and to, dis and to discuss it. So the brief history is followed by one or two questions. Okay, so examples of questions that might occur after the brief history would be, what is the diagnosis, category, severity of the, of the disease? Or maybe what else do you need to know if, if there's other information that you might want them to ask for? And basically ask questions that are related to the first learning objective, which I believe in your case was to make a diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. Okay. This is a bad history. Why is it a bad history? Too much. Yeah, too much stuff in it. I mean, I, I don't want to read all of that stuff, and very little of it has anything to do with what the learning objectives are. Cough on occasion, severe, vomiting, mucus, six weeks with a cold, over a blah, blah, who cares? <laughs> it's not, not useful, even though there are just two questions underneath. This is the kind of history that I see a, a lot. When you look at problem-based learning cases that are written, there's a tendency to put too much stuff. Don't do that. Here's a good history, better history. Penny Langley. Um, it's not a catchy name, but I've used it. I'm trying to figure it out. No, no, no. I, but I've used it for so long, I'm used to using it. So, <laughs> uh, She's a 13-year-old girl who's been wheezing and coughing two to three times a week for the last five months, despite regular use of her albuterol inhaler. She has rare night symptoms, but her asthma occasionally interferes with normal activities during the day. Okay, that's it. It's a pretty quick history. You can understand it. You immediately get a sense of what's going on. And you you have uh, you can you can see it, and it, there's not too much stuff. Sometimes you want to have additional information, and um, you know you can have a question like, "What else do you want to know?" But but you know they're going to want a little bit more information, so you can just give that to her. So include only relevant information. Don't include all the details. Her peak flows are usually 80 to 100 percent of personal dust. Occasionally drop below 80 percent. Her FEV1 is 98% of predicted, FEF25 is 84%. Notice what I don't have here is the entire spirometry with the flow volume loop. If, if I want to teach interpreting flow volume loops as a learning objective, I might put that in here, but that's not really what I'm trying to teach. So I'm trying to leave all that information out unless it's relevant to the learning objective. Uh, her ENO is 55. Okay, well, why do I put that in there? It's just an opportunity to describe ENO. It's not a learning objective, but it is kind of an interesting thing that I can add that the audience will look at and go, wow, what's that? And it will make them raise the question. They'll ask the question. Um, we'll describe it a little bit. Maybe somebody in the group already knows what it is, and I'll ask them to explain it to the rest of the group so they can teach each other. Uh, and then they'll have learned a little tidbit of something new. So it doesn't have to be a full learning objective worth of stuff for every piece of knowledge, but, but it is a little bit of information that might be helpful. Uh, the physical exam is normal. Notice I'm not describing the physical exam. I'm just saying it's normal. It cuts out all the, all the stuff. Okay, Pretty short and quick. And then my first question, which is uh, to assess the severity of asthma, is what is Penny's initial asthma severity? 
I've given enough information to know what the severity should be, uh, except that I haven't defined what the severity categories are. So this is an opportunity to show the audience, okay, to, sh to show them this kind of information and then ask the first learning objective. So rules of problem-based learning include information if it teaches the learning objectives. What is not included is assumed to be either normal or not important. Okay, uh, and when the patient, when the learner got this or that or that or that, you can make up some stuff if it doesn't really, if it's easy enough. For the most part, I would just, as they start asking these questions, what was this, what was that, what was that, because that's what the physicians do, uh, what you can say is, well, it's normal or it's not important to this case. And just let them be happy. We're not teaching environmental control. So they're going to ask, well, does she have a cat or are there smokers? And you say, well, you know, those are all really good questions to ask, but for, this, for the purposes of this case, let's assume that those are all, you know, not relevant. The environment's okay. And that, that way they've, they've, the learners have shown that, yes, they're conscientious in asking those questions, but, they don't, but they've done their due diligence and now they can move on to the rest of the case. And we don't get bogged down in those kinds of details. Okay. And then you want to follow it by one or two questions. What is the category? Uh, or what else do you need to know? Okay, and that's what we what we can do. Okay, so you've seen how a, an initial history can be developed. You might be able to provide them with a table of what the disparity categories are, if such a table exists. And then you ask a question: What is the severity, or what, whatever it is that your first learning objective? <coughs> so why don't you take a few minutes now and develop a history of what's his name, John Joe Schnoz? Jim Schnozzle. Jim Schnozzle. Okay. You, you came up with it. It's not my, my voice. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and come up with a, uh, with a history of Jim Schnozzle for the learning. Okay, so... How old do you want to him be? Make him a reasonable age so he could potentially do IT or something. Like a 10-year-old well, or okay. 12. Why would the age be an important thing to think about? Because if he truly has allergic rhinitis, then we don't want to make him five months old. <laughs> Five months old don't get allergic rhinitis very often. Also, your management might include things that a five-month-old might not right. be able to do, whereas a you know a twelve-year-old could take medicines that are maybe not approved for younger kids. Right. Those are all things to consider when designing the case and coming up with the age. And in many cases, you'll come up with the age of the patient, and then as you write the case, you'll realize that that age doesn't really work for what I want to teach. So you can change the age. That's why having a fictitious patient is much better than a real patient. Continue. So he can say 12 or fine. 12 year old. Do you want him to be seasonal or do you want him to be? So I was wondering if we should just put some symptoms and then make them ask about like the triggers and the seasons. Like since that's part of our objective. Okay. So we can just be kind of vague at first and then in the next part we can say like the season and the triggers. So what are his symptoms? He has. So nasal congestion, sneezing, itchy eyes. And we could say how long it's been going on, I guess. Um, for a year and a half or something. If anybody online wants to chime in, all the mics are unmuted. Um, and then just so we can answer questions that they ask so it's worse than the well so I think we write this initial part and then the <coughs> question and we'll write the second part. Oh okay. I think. So what else do we want to include in this initial part? Itchy itchy watery eyes. Maybe what medications they have already you tried or used or something. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Let's try Benadryl. Lorette, yeah, Benadryl. <laughs> All yeah, Benadryl, can't wake up. Hasn't everybody tried Benadryl? Uh -huh. <laughs> Benadryl and or loratadine, I guess everybody tried that too. Yeah, I think that's good. And Wysine drops. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> With no significant improvement. And we could just make a statement that he's otherwise healthy with no other medical problems. 
or we could give him something like asthma. Makes him more atopic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm tomorrow. Asking, along. Uh, but with a history of you could say intermittent asthma, yeah. fall controls. Pause so, needed. Hmm. Is that enough? Do or we could put say any, any other physical, you know, does he? Or oh you know, yeah. Salute. Or, uh, Do we? Or or China or section, like the physical exam portion. Yeah. Yeah. And if there are specific findings you want to the learner to know about, you can go into more detail about the exam. It's it's up to you what you want the learner to learn. We could say what what else, what other information would you need, and then they could say these questions and a physical exam. And then the next section could put physical. Mm -hmm. For history, do you want to say like family history, mother has history of allergies, yeah, and brother has eczema or something. Not important. You think it's important, Brock? No, no, no. no. I'm talking myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, uh, the nature of the uh, effluent, you know, is it runny or thick or whatever, things like that. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Beer or. In the, in listen, you guys see? talk about the yeah, nature of effluents that. enough. <laughs> 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 Makes us glad to be allergists and not gastroenterologists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's probably enough, and then we can answer questions and do more. Okay, so do you have a history? Can you read the history, please? Sure. 12 year old male who's had nasal congestion, sneezing, and itching for the past year and a half. He also has itchy, watery eyes with this intermittently. Tried Benadryl and Claritin and Visine drops for all of his symptoms, but hasn't really had any significant improvement. Um, he does have a history of intermittent asthma that's well controlled with albuterol as needed. Family okay. And yeah, and then we have family history: mother with seasonal allergies and brother, younger brother with eczema. And what's your question? What additional history would what yeah what, what I guess. additional history what else would you, you want like to know to yeah so what else are you going to tell them what's that what else are you going to tell them in the next in section in the response to that slide because so that's when we can talk about should we give them seizures? see they're going to ask about you know triggers and all that stuff but then ultimately you're going to have to give them right. information the answer to their, what they want to know let's say his symptoms are worse in the spring and the fall yeah. Mm -hmm. Symptoms are worse in the spring and fall. Um, um, and they usually subside in the winter time. Yeah. And then no worsening with, and then we can just say, like, things we would ask, like dust, cat, dog. Uh, what else? Mold. No worsening. Smoke. Good because then we can smoke, dust, dust, mold. Okay. What else do you want them to ask? What if it's worse with any scented candles or like, you know, some perfumes or anything or temperature changes? Yeah, so say not worse with all those things. Temperature change candles. So essentially, we're ruling out vasomotor. Right. For irritant techniques. Okay. <clears throat> so oh, and then physical exam. We want them to ask them physical exam. So what is, what's going to be on the exam? So let's see how they're examining him. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. make sure he doesn't have beans in his nose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, let's say nasal So cream. vitals are normal. Yeah, he has a nasal crease. Say, with what, the Denny Morgan lines or allergic shiners? Okay. True giveaway. <laughs> okay. Pale boggy turbinates. I don't think I've ever seen that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you could just say that 
comment that his lungs are clear since he does have asthma. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so. And then the next question. And what's your next question then? <coughs> would be what treatment would you recommend for this patient? Or what's the diagnosis and what treatment? What do you diagnose? Allergic what does the patient have? I mean, it's most likely allergic rhinitis because you'd have to definitively do testing. Oh, you wouldn't have to. You, as a primary doctor, you could treat them without doing testing. Okay. Actually, yeah. we'd probably recommend so they don't order a giant panel with a bunch of boots. Yeah. <laughs> well, another option, by the way, is not just what you diagnose, but what is your differential diagnosis? Oh, right. What do you? What could he have? What do you? Because you might have more than one thing, and it's not bad to have them list all the things that the patient might have, and then go through each of those things and decide as a group whether they think those things are appropriate or not. The differential, and then the treatment. So different show, we talked about allergic, and then non-allergic, or vasomotor. Or vasomotor. Okay. Infectious would be another one, since it, it's, it's, it's change of seasons, you know. Yeah. Now, for the case itself, you don't have to give them the differential. They're going to come up with their own differential. But when you give a handout at the end, you're going to give them a handout with all of this stuff. Then you put in all of the, the answers that you might have come up with. And those evolve as you run the case more often because you'll hear additional answers that make sense and you can just keep adding those so that the case evolves over time. Patient induced. I was trying to think of all the other weird <coughs> like non allergic ones, like they talk about pregnancy, which obviously he's telling yeah. all of them the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you've got a history, you've got some questions, you're gonna have them see now your learning objective was to diagnose allergic rhinitis, but you might maybe have second thoughts about that. Instead of diagnosing allergic rhinitis, come up with a differential diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. Is that maybe a more appropriate learning objective, you think? Yeah, I think we basically talked about diagnosing based on history, but... But you're actually asking them to come up with what could this patient have, and they're, they may conclude that it's allergic rhinitis, but what you're really having them do is come up with a differential, you know, a list of all the things that it might and that's objectives first, teaching the objectives and suddenly realizing maybe this objective isn't exactly what I want to teach, so you can go back and modify the objective. It, it kind of feeds back on itself so that both of them become go into sync with each other. Just something to consider. If we're teaching in the differential, do we have to address some of those things or ruling out them? Not necessarily. Okay. Like he's not on any medications? And Just like you don't have to do every detail of the history and the physical, you can. You don't have to do every detail of the differential. They can come up with it and then discuss it, but ultimately they're going to decide it's allergic rhinitis. Okay. But at least they've, they've at least written down or thought of all the other things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition, <coughs> you might need to provide some background information. So in the case of Penny Langley, I asked for the asthma severity, but what if the learners don't know what asthma severities there are? Maybe they aren't familiar with the NIH guidelines. So you might need to tell them asthma severity classifications. You may give them a table of that and have them look, at, look it up on the table and use the table to figure out what the severity might be. You might have step treatment for asthma. You might Show them normal value. If you ask them, you know, here are some lab tests, what do you think? Maybe they don't know what those lab tests are. So you might give them normal values for those lab tests so they can see if it's normal or not, what normal is. You would have a discussion about what normal is. Uh, recommendations from expert panels. The expert panel recommends this. Oh, I didn't know that. Now that I know that, that might affect my conclusion about this, this case. So you can provide that kind of background information. The learners may be asked to use this to interpret the information you've given. Um, so that, that can be very helpful, and it helps them to, to know that the information is available, the asthma categories are there, and they've actually used the categories now, so they're familiar with how using the categories works. Maybe one of the learners wouldn't know how to do it, but the other learners will show them, and so they're teaching each other. So the group is teaching each other. So that, that dynamic comes into play. Other things, you might want to provide some objective data. 
You might include lab results. You might actually put in a radiology report. If you're doing a PowerPoint, you might even put in the x-ray itself and let, let them look at it and then decide what they think it shows. Uh, you might put in pulmonary function tests or skin tests. If you're going to go to the, the real detail, though, other than just a very vague description of what the PFTs are, if you're going to show the, the actual flow volume loops and so on, then it may behoove you to make that one of the learning objectives because they're, they're going to spend a fair amount of time on it, learning it, and that becomes one of the objectives. And differentiating between what's a learning objective and what is sort of just something additional that they can learn about is just a judgment call that you're going to have to come up with. And it depends in part on how much time and effort you spend with the learner learning about that particular thing. Uh, do not include tests or results that are not pertinent. Okay, so if you want them to learn about uh, hyponatremia in Addisonian crisis, don't, don't put the entire chemistry panel in there unless there's some reason why you're trying to confuse <laughs> them by putting in a lot of irrelevant things. Just show them the pertinent test results. Um, limit, it limits times to discuss what is important. Otherwise, they're going to discuss all of the irrelevant stuff, and you'll never get to the important stuff that you really want them to learn. <laughs> so it's good to limit the amount of information. Uh, this type of information is usually followed by how do you interpret this information, what is your classification or diagnosis. And you can keep it fairly vague. Show the lab results and say, what do you mean, what do you, how do you interpret those? Keep it open-ended. Don't say, what do, you, what do you think of the sodium? Don't, don't be that specific. Just say, what do you think of this? Keep it kind of open. And let them have a conversation about it. Hmm. So here's an example. What is Penny's initial asthma severity. Okay, and you show them the different severities. And this is learning objective number one, categorize asthma severity in a 13-year-old girl or a 13-year-old. That was the first learning objective in Penny Langley. And so the first question is, what is her asthma severity? I'm showing you examples of what those severities might be, just in case you don't happen to know what they are. I'm even showing you a table that you can look at to try to decide what the severities are. Okay. Now your turn. So give additional history to Schnozzle, whatever is. <laughs> give the relevant findings. Give reference information if needed. Is there an ARIA guidelines on rhinitis categorization? There, there might be. Then you might want to put that in there. If you don't happen to know that right this second and don't want to go online to look it up for our purposes, you might just sort of say there is an, an ARIA uh, severity categorization, and we'll have them look at that and, and decide what category of severity of rhinitis. So you, could, you don't have to do that. It's something you might consider doing if you want to. Um, how do you interpret this information? Uh, design it, and then ultimately you want them to design a treatment plan once they've decided what the diagnosis is. So take a few minutes and go through this. Cool. kind of did that. Yeah. We did the additional history and relevant finding um, treatment plan. So we'd probably do. Is there any other information you're going to get? Or the, the, did you already come up with all of this? I kind of did that, yeah. The further you want to reiterate what you came up with that does this? So additional history. We got the family history of the mom with the seasonal allergies and the brother with the eczema. Oh, no. And the inner. That was in the first section. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So the symptoms are worse in the spring and fall, usually subside in the winter. Um, he has no worsening around pets, smoke, dust, mold, candles, or temperature changes. Um, he has physical exam-wise normal vitals. He does have the nasal crease and allergic shiners. He's got pale, boggy turbinates, and his lungs are clear. Oh, yeah. okay. And the question is, how do you interpret this information? So then we ask for the differential diagnosis, and then what treatment plan would they recommend? Well, first I would say, how do you interpret this information? Oh, okay. Okay. What does that mean? How do you interpret that? And so the group will look at that and go, wow, boggy terminates. Well, that means this. Or do you see that in allergic rhinitis? Or does that mean that you're afferent addicted or have a cold? Or well, how do you interpret, what is a Denny Morgan line? I don't know what that is, and somebody in the group might know what it is and can tell the others what it is. 
as a facilitator, and each of these sessions, by the way, is run by, with a facilitator. My job is to be as non-contributory as I can be, just to be quiet, answer questions, guide the group, keep them from running astray, keep them from attacking each other. <laughs> they really get into it. And, but not to add too much, not to guide the conversation too much, because I want, really want them to try to figure it out for themselves. And, and, and I think you have to make sure that incorrect information doesn't stand. Mm -hmm. It's hard to have incorrect information, but the group should work. Somebody work says something out. that's totally crazy. He's got bo boggy turbinates. That means he has cystic fibrosis. Well, no, it doesn't. Okay, so I, you know, as a facilitator, I'd say, well, well, that that's interesting. You know, how, what, 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 where did you hear that? Or can you explain that a little bit more? What, what do the rest of you all think about that? You know, and somebody who. You know, there's going to be somebody who knows that that's not true, who's going to maybe be too intimidated to object because the first person was very loud and vocal. And so, the second, so you might say, well, what do you think? Or, you know, does anybody have any other thoughts about what this might mean? And somebody else might say, well, I don't know that it really means that. It might mean that he's got allergic rhinitis instead. And somebody else might say, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. And pretty soon the group will sort of bring itself back to a balance. So you don't have to tell this person, no, you're wrong. Don't, don't ever do that, by the way. Don't say, oh, no, you're wrong. And even if they are wrong, let, let the group tell them that they're wrong. If the other people tell them they're wrong, it's a lot better than for the facilitator to just sort of dictate. Facilitators that are too involved can, cause, uh, can disrupt the process of learning. Mm -hmm. OK. <clears throat> so yeah, I guess that. Main thing is how do you interpret this information, and then the next slide would be, um, you know, what is your, what do you, what does this patient have, or what is your differential? You design, you know, another thing is to say you design a differential diagnosis. At which point they have a blank piece of paper, and you ask each of the people in the group to maybe just write down a differential diagnosis, and then share what they came up with to each other. You can give them a little activity to work through, and then they kind of compete with each other to come up with their differential and then they share it with each other and tell each other why they thought this and not that and have them debate it and eventually they can come to a conclusion about what they think the patient might have. Okay? So back to Penny. Does Dr. Uh, well, there is, yeah, there is a guideline for the diagnosis and management of rhinitis. It's the ARIA guidelines. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. could in your as you're developing this case, say, okay, so what is the severity of this patient's rhinitis based on the ARIA guidelines? I didn't know there was an ARIA guideline, so here's the, here's the table from the guidelines that defines what those severities are. And, you know, look at this table, you think it is. And so you can have them not only use the table to define the severity, but now they are aware of the fact that there is such a thing as an ARIA guidelines, which a lot of people don't know. <coughs> Okay, so Penny has mild persistent asthma. Uh, when I do this case, by the way, the, uh, the findings, the peak flow findings, the spirometry findings, the frequency of the symptoms, uh, what you want to do is you want to modify those symptoms so they're right on the borderline between one severity and the next. If you make it obviously this severity, or obviously that severity, then the whole group is going to go, yeah, it's this severity. But if you put it right on the borderline, then you get two groups, and then they have to kind of debate back and forth, which forces them to think a little bit more closely about what severities actually mean and what does it mean to be near the border of a category. Hmm. So as you run, what you're going to do is you're going to develop this case. You're going to use it with a group of learners. The learners are going to say, oh, the severity is this. You're going to say, well, that was too easy. I need to modify the parameter a little bit so it's not quite so clear. You want it to be gray, okay, which is okay. <clears throat> so that the next time you do the case, the groups are like, well, I think it's this, but there's a small group that thinks, no, I think it's that. And Penny's got mild persistent. No, I think she's got moderate persistent. No, I think it's mild persistent. And, and the, the ideal case, there's half and half. They're evenly divided, and then they really have to discuss it with each other and, and tear it apart. And that's how they learn the most, is when they're having that, that kind of discussion. Next question, doesn't, you don't have to provide a lot more information. All you have to do is say, well, what do you recommend for her initial treatment? Objective two, design a treatment plan. 
That's all you have to ask. What do you, how do you treat this? What are you going to do? Okay, you can show them this table. This is from the NIH, NHLBI guidelines. It tells you what the treatments are based on the severity of the asthma, the step of the, of the asthma. And then you, uh, you want to you know, ask them to come up with a treatment plan. And uh, let the group debate it for five to ten minutes or whatever until they kind of come up. Somebody will say albuterol, and somebody will say an inhaled steroid, and, and they'll debate it back and forth, and they'll look at the table. No, this says it's preferred to do this and that. And you can see how that, that will take place as the group debates it and goes through it. Eventually, they'll come up with a treatment plan. And after they come up with a treatment plan and present it to the facilitator or just you know, come up with it as a consensus, and you say, okay, now that you've come up with yours, I'm going to tell you what we did. Because in order for the case to move forward, you have to have it define what, what the next step is. And so, you know, your, tra your treatment plan is perfectly good, and, and that's fantastic. Great job. Okay, now just for argument's sake, hypothetically, let's assume that this was our treatment plan. Because we need to have a treatment plan to move forward. Because the rest of the case is predicated on this being the treatment plan, and I can't you know, we have a separate case for every plan they might come up with. So let's assume that this is the plan. Provide Penny with the following meds. Albuterol inhaler, inhaled steroid twice a day, instructions on a peak flow meter and an air chamber. And somebody might say, well, I didn't think peak flow meters were any good. And you could have a very brief discussion of that if they want to, or they might ignore that. That's not the learning objective. You don't need to spend a lot of time on that particular aspect of it. You can have a different case that talks about peak flow meters or spirometry. Okay. Inhaled steroid twice a day. I didn't say flow vent twice a day. I didn't say a nebulizer twice. I didn't go into any details. Okay. I just set a category of drug, which is what is in the step plan from the NIH guideline. I'm trying to be vague and generic so that I'm not playing favorite about any particular pharmaceutical agent. Okay. This all kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Then you set up the next learning objective. Okay. The next learning objective is to manage a case of asthma that flares up, gets worse. Pollen count goes up, patient gets a cold, whatever it is, asthma gets worse. So you describe a worsening of the disease, a change in his status, or some other common problem that normally arises. The eczema gets a lot itchier and becomes infected. You know, or the sinusitis, you know, flares up and gets green and turns yellow. That, you know, that, that you know, something like that. Something happens where the disease changes and gets a lot worse because that's a common thing that physicians are called on to uh, address. And so it's good to have the learners work their way through that kind of scenario. For Penny, her asthma flares up. She, she gets a cold or something like that. So here's how I set it up for Penny. Um, so you get a 2 a.m. phone call. So it's always a 2 a.m. Uh, two months later, okay, so I've set the stage. 2 a.m., you get a phone call from Penny's mother. She tells you that Penny's done well. Her asthma control test was 22. What's an asthma control test? We haven't defined it. You don't have to go into any detail with it, but the group might want to know what it is. You can define an asthma control test. You can show them what it looks like. You can explain it. You don't have to go into any detail. It's not one of the learning objectives. But, but there's no harm in, you know, at least making them aware that there is such a thing. And this is how you would use it, asthma control test. But now Penny's coughing and wheezing for 12 hours. <clears throat> She's used albuterol. It, it helps, getting good relief. Peak flow has dropped to 65% of her personal best. She's not in any respiratory distress. And then the question is, what are you going to tell Penny's mother to do? What do you do? Okay, notice 65% is borderline. I've run this case, this particular case, I've run many, many times. And if I put the peak flow up at 70 or 75, everybody thinks it's a pretty mild episode and they go one way. And if I say it's uh, 60 or 55%, they all think it's a really bad episode and they go a different way with what they recommend. When you say that it's 65, somehow psychologically the groups seem to schism into two evenly divided groups. One group thinks it's a really bad episode, and one group thinks it's a pretty mild episode, and they, they start to debate each other. And so I've set the peak flow percent, and, and it's amazing uh, what 
parameters in this thing will set them off. You can you know play tweak a variety of different things to see what makes the difference. In this case, for some reason, the peak flow value seemed to be the thing that caused the group to split into two factions. And that's exactly what you want them to do in a very friendly way to debate the pros and cons of how you're going to manage this, uh, this episode. And you can sort of imagine in your own mind, you've probably already got an idea what you would tell Penny's mother to do and recognize that the other people in this room might have a different opinion about what you might do and, and how that debate might take place. You can sort of picture that in your in your head. So what do you advise her to do? And in some cases it might help, you know, if it's a group of pediatric residents and maybe they haven't done a lot of asthma management, they may not know what kinds of things you could do. Maybe, you know, if it's an if it's allergy fellows or more experienced residents, they would probably have an idea and, and you could just ask them to tell you, but if they, if they don't seem to be able to come up with ideas or they seem to have a hard time uh, coming up with suggestions of what Penny's mother might do, you might give them a list of options, okay? Keep adding, uh, keep using more albuterol, add a LABA, add, increase the dose of the steroid, add a leukotriene modifier, take an oral steroid, go to the emergency room, use your nebulizer more frequently, switch, stop using the inhaler and switch to the nebulizer. Uh, other options. You always want to leave an other available in case somebody has another option that might be available. Give them some suggestions of things they might want to discuss or think about. Uh, and this really does lead to a fairly prolonged debate among the learners when, I, when you do this particular case. This is, these cases are all on the allergy server, by the way, and you're welcome to use them if you'd like to. They're, some of them are, are pretty fully developed. So now it's your turn. We're going to talk about Mr. Schnozzle. Schnozzle. Sounds like a garden hose. <laughs> Describe a problem that occurs with this patient. Something happens. Set it up so there are several options. There's no right answer. You want to generate a discussion. Um, finish by asking, what do you do now? Or what do you tell the mother to do? Or what do you recommend? Something of that nature. And you might offer suggestions if there are a limited number of options, if the options are infinite, then just leave it open-ended and let the group come up with their own idea about what they might want to do. So develop this. Your problem can be you start developing nosebleeds with the medication. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, and then, then you can go over asthma technique. could flare during. So that would be like you need to see a specialist. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking... Or it's not getting better with the current... I'm thinking that it's ragweed season now. The pollen yeah. goes up and his nasal symptoms get a lot worse. That would that would be a kind of, up, of a worsening of the disease that might be amenable to discussion. So you might think about that. Do we say, do we answer a question about treatment? Like we start him on a different antihistamine, a nasal steroid. Yeah, what was your treatment? I mean, I'm assuming nasal steroid was what we chose, right, for the yeah, first line, and then oh, and um, an eye drop. Yeah. Okay, but now the pollen count went up. Yeah. So then it got worse. Off. Mom's calling. He's miserable. Can't go to school. What are you going to tell her to do? So this is initial, right? So now that he's getting worse, at that point we would probably recommend referring him to an allergist for skin testing and possible immunotherapy. Yeah, but the allergist yeah. takes a few weeks to get in to see. So well, like what are you going to tell her to do right now? He can't go to school. You know, talk about a voice. Add a nasal antihistamine. But wouldn't that be the question to ask the group to, de to debate? Right. See, what they're going to do is they're going to say, yeah, I'm going to refer them to an allergist. And as a facilitator, you don't really want them to do that because they're just, they're not really, they're not dealing with it then. You want them to have to figure it out themselves. It's how they learn. Well, you so, mean you could go over the guidelines when they talk about how much worse. Mm -hmm. you know, just, yeah. Can't go to school. He's miserable. And they're saying, well, I'm going to send them to an allergist. And if you don't want that to be what they do, you can say, well, the allergist takes three weeks and the mom wants to know today because he can't go to school. Okay. Okay. It sort of forces you in a plausible way back to you have to figure out what 
our objective was just to decide when to refer them to an allergist. So is that to... really? That could be an objective. But or that was one of ours, but we don't have to. You do might that. consider what do you do when it's pollen season? Yeah. So we can um, talk about avoidance, avoidance, nasal irrigation, adding a nasal and histamine. Yeah, nasal and histamine. To make sure he has proper technique so that he's getting the medication. Review technique. Make sure he's taking it every day instead of just as needed. Anything else? And then consider referral. Okay. Okay, so those are some of the, you're offering some of the options that they might want to consider? Mm-hmm. Other. Other. <laughs> is there anything else they can come up with? So one of the options is, well, let's get an allergy shot. Well, that, that's not going to really help right no. now. Mm. You can't go to school today. Who wants to go to school? <clears throat> okay. So you kind of have an idea now of how you would develop that that case, mm -hmm. and you can you can now imagine patient's nose gets worse, pollen counts up. You know, mom's calling. You can't go to school. What do what do we do? What do you recommend? You can imagine the group sitting around here debating that. Now that's that's a really important topic and coming up with ideas of what they might recommend. Okay. And then you want to finish the case. You see, there is an end. Mm -hmm. Penny returns to your office six weeks later. She did well after the last episode. See, we, we had them write an asthma action plan for Penny Langley. We explained what to do when the asthma flares up. Okay, she did well after the last episode and wants to know what to do now that she is doing well. <clears throat> she wants to know if she needs to keep taking the medicine and how often she should come back. So you give Penny an asthma action plan and describe future management. And you ask the audience, now what are you going to tell her to do for the future? What's the next, what, what's next for her? Refer to an allergist, make sure she has an action plan. You know, what, do you step down now? What, what's the long term? How frequently do you follow up? That kind of stuff. And, and you can see that this would be a, a good place to close. A, you know, a very happy patient, you've gotten through the, the worst of it, you've learned a lot of stuff along the way about how to manage this, this condition and, and so on. So we've finished it up. I think with Joe, with Snozzle, we've kind of discussed that. Two, you want to know what to recommend for long-term management, and I, I suspect you want to refer them to an allergist and see if you might get allergy shots. Might be an option, too. Okay. Move to Arizona. I, I don't <laughs> Yeah, is it going to happen again next spring, or is it going to happen again? Well, wouldn't it be nice to know what he's actually allergic to, so you can predict when it's going to happen and have a plan in place? Because you'll know what the pollens are and when they're in the air. Okay, so you've seen how to develop a case, and I, you've you've only done this one, and. Um, I would suggest that you consider getting together and maybe refining it, making it a more complete case. And I can show you what a full case, fully developed case looks like. Um, and then you might want to then get a great group of pediatric residents when you do the didactics, for example. That would be a good place to do it. Uh, instead of giving a lecture on rhinitis, you might do a problem-based learning on rhinitis. I think the residents would probably have a good time. And since it's right after lunch, maybe they stay awake for it. Uh -huh. Maybe? Uh -huh. oh. Okay, or maybe not. I heard you say. Okay. Now, um, I gave this. I did this session at the Academy of Allergy meeting two years ago, and I had tables of. What I had them do is to develop these cases, and then I had them take their case and switch it to a different table, and then they each did the other tables' cases. So they actually ran their own cases with each other. It was really interesting came up with some great cases. I have them in a folder somewhere. I need to compile them and put them into these slides so that we can run their cases. OK. <clears throat> in terms of discussion, after you do a problem-based learning case, you need to, you know, don't take up all of the time. If you've got one hour, do 45 minutes. 
make sure there's plenty of time for discussion because after interacting in this fairly intense way, the group of people, the learners, are really going to want to debrief. They're going to want to ask questions. They're a little bit puzzled by this. It's a different way of, of learning. They're going to want to talk to each other. Some of them are still going to be fighting over, you know, how to treat an exacerbation of the asthma. So, you know, you need to address each of those issues and have them all leave with the satisfaction of, you know, of having learned something. So you need to leave adequate time for discussion. During the case, you are the facilitator. If you wrote the case and you're going to run the case, you're the facilitator. Okay? The discussion is a time to review the case, giving your answers. And emphasize these are not the correct answers. These are just the answers that I came up with. In many cases, they're answers that you've accumulated having run the case several times. And uh, each time you run it, the group comes up with you know, maybe some different nuances or different ideas. And you can take those ideas and incorporate it into the case so that it evolves. And then you have a revised case. So the case is constantly evolving into a better and better case until eventually it becomes a, a very good case. Um, mention that there are options that may have been missed. Okay, because you, you, now you've got the advantage of having run it a whole bunch of times and you may have got, come up with ideas that maybe the group didn't come up with and you can show them those ideas, share that with them. Praise the attendees on what they did well. What a, what a great job you did discussing this. You were very thoughtful and insightful. You, you handled it in a very professional way, and you came up with some you know, excellent ideas. And here are some other ideas you might also think about, but um, you know, what a good job you did. Provide a summary of the important take-home points, usually on one page. So these are the things that you want them to take home that they should remember about this particular case. OK, just a reminder, these are some common pitfalls. Don't make the case too complicated. Okay, Too many steps, and then you've already been here for over an hour. Uh, the case will become too long and complicated if you make it too detailed. Don't do that. Make it fairly straightforward. Teach only a few learning objectives, and then teach a few other learning objectives the next time. You'll have another opportunity to do it. Answering too many questions during the case. Don't answer too many questions. Be somewhat vague and aloof about it. If they ask, well, what is this or that or that, just say, well, it's, it's normal or it's not relevant. Okay. Um, you are the facilitator. Your job isn't to run the thing. Your job is to help them run the thing. They're the learners. You're there to help facilitate them learning. Ask others to answer the question. If somebody says, well, what about this? You say, well, that's a really good question. Does anybody here know the answer to that question? It's, it's, usually somebody will have an idea about the answer to the question, and you can ask them to explain it. It's much better if the learners answer the question to each other than if you answer the question. Don't, don't answer the question if, if anybody else can answer it. Uh, if there's just something that they have to know to, answer, to be able to move forward and nobody has a clue what you're talking about, then, then perhaps you can take a few minutes and, and exp you know, give them enough information so that they can move forward with the case. But don't give too much information. Uh, don't dwell on unimportant data. If necessary, limit the discussion to proceed with the case. They get really bogged down on peak flows, and I think peak flows are great, and I think they're terrible, and, well, you've got to use the right peak flow, and you can jimmy the peak flow, and you say, well, those are all really important uh, few things, and uh, you know, we'll certainly take those into account, but we, we really need to move forward with the case now, so let's, let's move on to the next slide. As the facilitator, your job is to keep it flowing so it doesn't bog down on minutia. If you let it bog down on minutia, then the two people who are debating the peak flow are going to really get into it, and the rest of them are going to start losing interest. They'll start texting or falling asleep or, or whatever it is that they do. And you really want to keep the group engaged. Okay, so developing your own case, decide on a topic. There's a lot of topics, obviously. Decide on the learning objectives. Okay, use a template to get started, and, and there are templates in the uh, allergy folder for problem-based learning. The most important thing is to keep editing it. Run the case, edit it, modify it, run the case again, edit it, modify it, and eventually the case will, will evolve into something that you can really be proud of, and you can have a library of problem-based learning cases that will teach a variety of different topics. We, we have such a library on the allergy folder under PBL, problem-based learning. Uh, ask for feedback. Ask the group that did the, ca the case 
what they thought about it, what they might suggest to make it a more enjoyable or you know educational case. Re refine the case and practice. Present the cases as often as you can. The more frequently you serve as a facilitator and develop cases, the more skillful you become at doing it. Hmm. That's, that's yeah. Hmm. Problem-based learning. Comments or questions? Yeah, Jay. Yeah, Brock. Uh, I'd probably be your worst nightmare in such a discussion. <laughs> I'm sure you would. But uh, because I would definitely try to get it more complicated. <coughs> uh, it's kind of interesting to consider the different approaches in that from a scientific point of view, everything you say I don't believe. Uh, and I want you to prove it. All right. Okay. And, and, and that's, you know, that's where the rub comes in. So you say, well, what else could it be is my approach. And, you know, that, that I got a phone call, so damn it. Uh, but what do you think about that? I think you're right on target, Brock, and I agree with you 100%. Yeah. You know, just thinking, I know that Brock is really into components and yeah. molecules and yeah. allergens and so on. Right. How would you teach somebody about components and allergens, the molecular biology of allergens, using problem-based learning? How would you do that? Can you think of off the top of your head what kind of case that might be? Got it? a food allergy case and then you're trying to decide if maybe you could consider doing a big challenge and what further testing can you consider? Right, right. Or the patient has is is has positive skin tests to everything, but they've only been exposed to a few things and how do you figure out what things are relevant to them and why would this one react when they're only allergic to that thing or you know kind of start putting those together and then show charts of allergens and how what cross reacts with what and and so on and start to look at the motifs you can you can you can see where that might you might be able to come up with something like that it's, it's you're going to have to provide the learners with a lot of information a lot of tables to look up at you know, if they have tables and have to use them to figure out what the patient is sensitized to, ultimately it could be very helpful. Here's a patient who's got a positive test to lots and lots of aeroallergens, but you only want to put six things into their extract. Which six things would cover all of the stuff that they're allergic to? Mm -hmm. How would you figure that out? And you might be able to use a table of cross-reactivities and relationships and motifs and so on to come up with that kind of approach. So, you know, I can see where that, you might be able to come up with a PBL for molecular diagnosis. There's also a trap in this. Uh, I think there's a heuristic error that's made quite frequently in medicine, and that is that uh, this patient looks like the last one, so he must have the same thing. And, and I think you really have to guard against that because it's, uh, um, you know, there are a lot of other possibilities. And with allergic rhinitis, or just rhinitis, uh, there's a heck of a lot of different possibilities. Well, that's why you can have them come up with a differential diagnosis rather mm -hmm. than what is the diagnosis. And then on the next slide, you say you decide that it's allergic rhinitis. So you tell them, you can sort of solve it by telling them what, just for argument's sake, the patient has. But the differential diagnosis is what the learners come up with and I actually have two uh, rhinitis cases in the in the library and I'll just give it away right now. One of them is Jeff Waters, Jeff Waters or something Waters and the other, no Jeff Raintree and something Waters, Raintree and Waters, I wanted to have, I'm not very creative with names, but one of them has allergic rhinitis and the other one has a common cold. Okay and so you've got to figure out what what it is, and you might decide, well, he's got allergic rhinitis, and it turns out he has a cold. It's different, and you might treat it differently. And some of the findings are subtly different, too. And so you can design cases that really do lead to different approaches, and, and, and yet they're very instructive. So by having those two different cases, you might be able to, uh, to teach different things, how to treat a cold instead of an allergy. So, all right. Any other comments, questions? from the group. What do you think? Do you guys do PBL in your residency? Mm -mm. They don't use problem-based learning for the residency? I haven't done much of it, no. No? 
I guess we don't do it as much here as we should either, but we probably ought to do it more. Okay. All of my lectures were in residency. All of your resident, your lectures were PBL in residence. Where did you go again? Loyola in Chicago. Loyola. And I went to Mizzou for my first two years and did the same thing. So we had how, some lectures, but then we had PBL cases every week. We had them like every morning. Yeah, we had them for like morning Monday. Did Monday. you find that to be a good way to learn? Yeah, mm -hmm. it forces you to participate and you pay attention. You have to be prepared because they'll just call on you and mm -hmm. you can't look like an idiot. I think it would be awesome <laughs> for didactic. No. Well, so you already knew all this stuff. Yeah, learning objectives. So is this kind of the approach that they took? This yeah, and then we would take case? our lectures and we would, we would make them like that. You yeah. go up to the board and help them. Yeah. The one thing I don't like to do with PBL is to put people on the spot. Yeah, they, they used to do that. <laughs> they would call on you. I, I don't like to call on people. I just ask for a volunteer. Well, they would do that if nobody volunteered. But nobody would ever volunteer. So they would end up having to call on people because otherwise it would just be completely quiet. Or <laughs> the four, like the same two people. Yeah, there is like, a certain component of education that's it involves being scared to death. <laughs> yeah, because if you, I mean, you'd you'd want to read up on it the night before because if you didn't, then you'd just look like a big idiot. Yeah, but <laughs> to my point of view, that's the backwards way of doing problem-based learning, because if you're reading up on it the night before, so you're prepared, then you've already done the learning the night before, mm -hmm. and you're not using the problem-based learning as a vehicle for the learning, mm -hmm. and so you're trying to cement things that you've that you've sort of you had to memorize. But but the problem-based learning assumes that the audience has a certain and educational a level. Right. It's and not if, and if that you don't true. have that educational level in the audience, then it's it's really hard. I I tried Why doing not? this with medical students who really didn't know anything about the topic, and it was really hard because you, you get a lot of misinformation thrown out there. So right. if, if it's not some minimum level, I find it's it really not cool. like we were reading for five hours the night before, just skimming the material and then so you're a little bit more prepared and I think it actually reinforced because then you really pay attention to those small details during the lecture and <clears throat> a lot of times they'll ask questions at the end. And additional information. Additional, yeah. I would, like, I would propose that that's not the pure, if you're a purist, uh, problem-based learning practitioner, which I like to think of myself as a purist, then the learning should take place in the session. And then afterwards, you should be really curious, you know, all the stuff that we talked about and came up with these ideas. And, and now you're curious to find out more about it. And so then you do the reading. So you do the case first, and then you do the reading, as opposed to doing the reading first and, so that you can do the case properly. Mm -hmm. Okay, if, if you feel like you're under the gun to do the right job with the case and you're being graded and all of that stuff, then that's not problem-based learning. That's pseudo. I think that's... That's sort of a problem-based learning-like situation, but it's not true for PBL. PBL, um, you learn during the session, and then you supplement the learning afterwards because you're curious about stuff you learned and heard during the session. That's actually the most effective way to learn the stuff, too. From an adult learning perspective, all of the research shows that that's the most effective approach. If you have to know the stuff before you so you can perform properly in the problem-based learning case, it's really a much less effective way. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, we didn't know what the topic was. We just know GI. So it wasn't like, yeah. you know, but either way. No. Either way. Yeah. yeah. So I'm a purist, so and we can be pure. We're in an allergy fellowship now. So <laughs> there's no grades. It's just learning stuff, and that's the best way. So, all right, we're going to stop there. Um, let everybody take off. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this has been Conferences on Analogy from Children's First Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. next time.